Good morning, Cornerstone Bible Church. It is so exciting to be here with you today in the house of the Lord. Andy, I love you, brother. It is good to see you. Welcome back home to your family. All right, it's going to be a good day. Listen, today we're just going to stop and we're going to celebrate all that God has done. Because at some point, every single one of us was spiritually blind and now we can see. We were deaf and now we can hear. We were dead and now we are alive. And not just for today, but for every day for an eternity, we have a reason to celebrate and praise because Jesus Christ came. And because he died and rose again, he has saved us from our sins. So let's stand and let's praise his name.
Sometimes we wonder, why don't we see the miracles that we saw in the New Testament, in the early church? Why don't we see God move today like he has all throughout history? And I would say to you this morning, the problem is not God. The problem is us. We don't live with faith. We do everything in our own power. We don't have God-sized dreams or visions. We lean into security and safety, and we've made everything about our comfort. So we don't need faith, because we just function like this, in our own little boxes. Let me challenge you this morning. If you want to see miracles, supernatural things, salvations, things that no one can explain, start living a life of faith. God is never the problem. We need to be his people again. We need to break out of our apathy, of our self-centeredness, of our materialism. We need to get back out and get on the water. Because Christian, listen to me. Storms will come, but in the presence of our Savior, we will walk right over the waters. He will never let us drown. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a God of miracles. That the things you did yesterday, you are still doing today and you have promised to do tomorrow. Now, Father, I ask that you break down our sense of self-sufficiency, our false security, our self-centeredness. Father, we need to die to self. And what better time to focus on what that means than this resurrection season? Because, Father, when something dies, you are the God of the resurrection. 
So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. All right, this time children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Wow, that's a new one. We've had car lights being left on at times and alarms going off, but somebody left their car running. So you really got excited to run in the church today, and I really appreciate you. It's an Infinity, and it's GLU4006, a gray Infinity. Parked in the front, your car is running. I'm sure someone would be happy to take it home. That's not you. It's a nice car, so you might want to turn it off. So God has been blessing again, and our church has seen some incredible growth in salvations, people taking next steps, coming and attending on a Sunday morning. Um, so one of the things we need to do is we will need to have children's church throughout the entire service. So starting Easter morning, you'll be able to bring your children directly to children's church. Now, we know that this is a very family-friendly oriented church, and there are a lot of kids. So we are working on a plan to have two separate children's churches, age appropriate. So we are praying over and doing what we need to do to serve your children well. So Easter morning, your kids can go straight to Children's Church, and that's how we will do this moving forward for the future. This morning, we're going to start a new series. I can't believe we're coming up on Easter Sunday already. It just feels like the year just started. So we started out 2023 with a series we like to do here at Cornerstone called Cornerstone DNA. Because we want to make sure the DNA of our church is based on what we see in the Bible, not our culture. Because what is in our DNA will actually grow out of our church. And we want spiritual fruit that will remain. We want a church where the disciples, not the Pharisees, would be comfortable to call home. We can never forget that this is God's church. It's not our church. Right? We're stewards for just a short season. So we're going to build it his way because we want to honor his name. And then from there, we went on to our series, Love Is. Because the Pharisees, the religious people, will always be known for following the law. That is their calling card. That is their bragging right. But disciples of Jesus Christ should always be known for their faithful love. Love for one another, love for their community, love for their God. That is what God's people should be known for. You know, it's the love of the redeemed that is the Lord's receipt. It proves that we've actually been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. You know, God's love is so beautiful because it's covenantal. It's not contractual. You know what that means? It's not based in how you behave. It's based in who he is. So he loves you in spite of you, not because of you. And that shouldn't make you feel shame. It should set you free to have gratitude that he would love you that way. See, it's that love that caused God to send his one and only son to seek and to save the lost. So God's love restores everything we lost because we chose to rebel against him. You know, we lost our peace because we disobey. We lost our innocence because we willingly sin. We lost our communion because we walk away from him in the flesh, not towards him by faith. We lost our living hope because we are all hopelessly dead in our sins. So this morning, we're going to begin our new series that will lead us right into Resurrection Sunday called Lost and Found. Because everything we have lost, we can find again in the person of Jesus Christ. His love resulted in the greatest search and rescue mission humanity will ever know. So I want to encourage you this morning. If you know anyone who you love and they're lost, they haven't found Jesus. Invite them the next few weeks. Invite them to watch it online. Invite them to come with you Sunday because you never know. Doesn't matter how lost someone may be, no one is so lost they can't find Jesus Christ. So today's message is lost and found peace. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for this opportunity. What a privilege it is to preach your word, to stand here before you knowing that you will do something that I can't do, that you're not depending on me this morning, that your Holy Spirit will take your living word and change hearts and minds and draw them to Jesus. And then I get to sit here, Father Lord, and be a part of the wonderful things you are doing. So Father, I ask that you clear our minds, clear our hearts, remove our distractions and our anxieties, help us to hear from you, Father. We don't need just the logos this morning. Father, we love your word, but we need a rima. We need a word in due season today. Father, we need to hear from you individually. We need to do some things in our hearts that we can't do. So Father, do what only you can do this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis. If I can get a, a small bottle of water uh, up here. Genesis, then we're going to go to Zechariah, then we're going to go into Luke and to Romans a little bit, but Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It starts with in the beginning. So if you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the seat below, right in front of you. If you don't own a Bible and you're a visitor, that is your Bible. That is our gift to you. It was meant to be with you. We'll also have the verses on the screen. So Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to go through verses 1 through 6. Thanks, Mike. Much appreciated. All right. One day, the serpent asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Man, I got to tell you, let me just stop for a second. This is not part of the message, but isn't that what Satan does to all of us? Did God really say that? Did he mean that? I mean, I know what it says, but does it really mean that? Of course, we may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, don't eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. By the way, hear this. God never said don't touch it. He said don't eat it. A lot of times we misinterpret the word of God ourselves. All right, so there's a lot of misunderstanding here. You won't die, the serpent said. God knows your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, by the way, who was with her. So Adam was passively sitting by. We love to dump on Eve, but he was like, all right, whatever you do, I'll do it, all right? And he ate it too. Right, so the, the problem, right, inherently for all of us is that humanity has lost God's perfect peace. Now, before this exact moment in human history, nothing had ever gone wrong. Every day was literally perfect. Adam and Eve walked around in perfect peace with God and in perfect peace with one another. And I don't want to rush past that this morning, because I think we are so far removed from God's perfect peace that we don't even know what peace is anymore. We've got to misdefine it, because God's peace, God's shalom, is so much greater than we can even imagine. Like, we hear the word peace, what do we think? Absence of conflict. There's no active fighting, We'll actually call that peace. But passive people does not equal perfect peace. Because it could look calm above the shore and have a storm brewing right below the surface, right? I want you to listen to what one scholar had to say about shalom. The webbing together of God, humans, and creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what Hebrew prophets were referring to when they said shalom. We call it peace. But it means far more than peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. 
It means universal flourishing, wholeness, delight. It's when our natural needs are satisfied, when our natural gifting is fruitfully employed, and we live in joyful wonder as our Creator welcomes those in whom He delights. Shalom is humanity living in perfect harmony. Does that sound like the world we live in today at all? Does like any of that resonate with you? Oh, yeah, we got that. One of the first things we all teach our children growing up is what? Life is inherently unfair. Daddy, mommy, that's not fair. Life is unfair. How often have we said that? But another word for unfair is what? Unjust. When something is unfair, it means it's inherently unjust, and we serve a God who the Bible says is just. So if you serve a God who is love, we know he desires us to do what? Love. We're made in his image. If we serve a God who is just, you know he desires us to live with justice because we are made in his image. See, we lost our peace with God, and for the first time, injustice entered the world. And when injustice is present, people cannot live with peace with one another. There's a reason why the chant throughout history, when rebellions come, when protests arise, is no justice, no, no peace. There can be no peace in the presence of injustice. I mean, let's just look at how we're living today. Countries around the world are one conflict away from an all-out war. A drone hits a fighter. We don't know what's going to happen. Someone crosses a border. The next famine that wipes out a large percentage of our grain. You want to see peace pass real quick? See, we've gotten used to living with this knowledge that we have a peace that's enforced by what? Superior firepower? They have this thing called mutually assured destruction. So our version of peace, how broken we are, is that we both have a gun pointed to each other's heads and we call that peace. That's not God's version of peace. And let's make it a little more personal. I mean, there is no relational peace anymore. Forget about socio-political. How about just relational peace? I mean, the divorce rate is higher than it's ever been. And the only reason why it's going to go down is because less people are getting married. They're so disenchanted with the idea of marriage, they're just deciding not to do it because everyone they know has failed at it. And that goes for Christians and non-Christians. I'm not preaching at the world, I'm preaching to us. I am a pastor, which means I spend an inordinate amount of time with saved people. I fight against it, I love you, but like Jesus, I want to be in the community, right? But I spend a lot of time with Christians. And I gotta tell you, I don't know many marriages that are flourishing and whole. Why? Because there were relational consequences when Adam and Eve lost their peace with God that actually comes down to our marriages today. So back in Genesis, Ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Then God said to the woman, You ready for this, ladies? I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. I like that part. <laughs> to the man, he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit that I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed. Because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you will eat its grains. By the sweat of your brow now. You will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust. And from dust you will return. There's a lot to unpack right there. That directly influences our lives our marriages, how we live today. So before Adam and Eve sinned, they lived in what we would call just utopia. They had this perfect relationship with one another. Everything they needed was provided for them. They were 100% content 
100% of the time. And when they served God, they served one another. They had no body image issues. They just walked around naked and unashamed, picking fruit off the thing, just, you know, bathing in streams. I mean, it's like gorgeous what I'm, this picture in my mind. And then they said, and we see death enters the world. And the first sacrifice is made as God makes animal skins, right? A blood sacrifice. Right? We see all this prophecy right away to cover Adam and Eve. And all of a sudden, they are naked and they're ashamed. And beyond just that, some things now have changed until God comes back and restores this shalom. Number one, having babies is going to hurt a lot. No kidding. I'm with you. Not, not really with you, to be honest. <laughs> I, listen, can I just, man, you're going to be mad at me for a minute, but like, can I just talk for a minute? That whole man flu thing that the woman talked about is kind of true. We get a sniffle and we're down for a week, right? These ladies like drop babies, right? And then you go back in the field and keep working, right? If men had babies, we'd all be single parent, I mean, single, single child families, right? I would never go through that twice. And men, listen, now we got to work for a living. Not for the things we want, but for the things we need. And it's not going to be easy. And we're going to scratch a living by the sweat of our brow. You know, sometimes we work so hard to make a life for our family that we actually miss walking through life with our family. That was never the design. That was never what God intended. Sin brought that into the world. See, contentment is not going to come natural anymore. We're not going to be satisfied anymore. Because of sin, we're always going to think we need a little bit more to be satisfied. You know, study after study shows that no matter what you make, you think you need 20% more to be happy. So if you make 50, right, then you need 60. If you make 100, you need 120. If you make a million, you need $1,200,000. Whatever it is, we live above our means. No matter what we make, we need 20% more. We are never satisfied. We always think, just a little bit more, and I'll be good. I mean, look at Adam and Eve. Everything is free. Forget about a sale. It's free. You can have whatever you want. Just don't touch these things over here. Oh, that's what I want then. I just need a little bit more. They needed a little bit more and they lost it all. How many Christians, how many people have lost it all because they thought they needed a little bit more? And then they wish they never went down that road. I mean, listen, I don't care who you are. None of you are Solomon. Okay? Solomon was better looking than you could ever hope to be. He had more money than you could ever hope to make. Right? He had more sex than all of us combined for our entire lives. Okay? He had more power than the most powerful man that ever walked the face of the earth after him. And before he died, he said, if that's all, it's worth nothing. So he had everything he wanted 2,000 times and said, is that it? It's never enough. We've lost that contentment, that peace within ourselves when we lost our relationship with God. And then we lost our biological peace, right? Says, from ashes you come, from ashes you will now return. What does that mean? Slowly but surely, our bodies are breaking back down into dust. I'm feeling a little bit of that right now. Like two weeks ago, two weeks ago, I was, I don't know, I was here at church. And I was in a meeting with somebody. And I was doing, I don't know what I was doing. But I, I sat down really quickly, and I felt something. So I went to my chiropractor. He said, well, what, what did you do? I said, well, I sat down. I said, said this, is, this is a true conversation. Did you plop? I said, are you calling me a plopper? She goes, well, did you plop? I said, I plopped. It was like a Seinfeld episode, under 40, Google it. Very good stuff, right? But I plopped. And I had two weeks of chiropractor appointments to undo the plop. Right? I didn't score the winning touchdown. I didn't lift that personal record weight. 
right? I wasn't saving a baby from a burning building. I sat down too fast. <laughs> right? And if you're under 40 and you're not trying to hear me right now, it will happen to you. <laughs> and yes, I'm in sin as I say that. God forgive me. Our bodies eventually betray us. Why? Because we lost peace with God. So it's going to break back down. See, we're made to live in this endless state of worship. And because we sinned, we live with this endless, endless state of worry and anxiety. Those are the things we lost when sin came into the world. We lost the peace of God. You ready? Because we lost peace with God. It affected everything. But God had a plan. There was a person in whom we could find perfect peace again. Zechariah chapter 9. Everyone's like, I have no idea what that is. Go to the table of contents. You're going to be all right. Your neighbor needs to, too. Don't even think. Old Testament, right? In the prophets, you'll find it. It'll be on the screen. Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is and victorious, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Israel and the horse of Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. So humanity had lost its perfect peace with God, but God already had a plan. To make it possible again. You know, next week is traditionally in our culture, in our church culture, the week that churches celebrate Palm Sunday. Anyone grew up on Palm Sunday? All right, that was the Sunday my brothers and I were guaranteed to be grounded every year because they would walk in and they would actually give us a palm branch and the leaf, which, like a bunch of young boys, is a weapon. They're going to hit each other. You're going to hit the people in front of you. Every Palm Sunday, we were grounded after church my entire childhood. But I really kind of prefer to talk about Jesus' triumphant entry in Jerusalem a week earlier than traditionally, because I want to take our time next week considering the cross of Jesus Christ. Because here's our instinct. Our instinct is to come to church and shout, Hosanna! on Palm Sunday, right? And celebrate on Palm Sunday. And then we kind of skim over the suffering on the cross part so we can get to the He is risen on Resurrection Sunday. But we can understand what we need to find if we don't understand what Jesus lost for us to find it. Right? The, the cross isn't exciting to us. Right? We give it lip service, but we don't go too deep into it. You know, God proclaims his plan to redeem his people before Adam and Eve even realized the peace that they had lost. Right back in Genesis now, in verse 15, God tells Satan right away, hey, listen, you did this. Here's the deal. One of Eve's descendants is going to crush your head. Right? If you're taking notes, write down Genesis 3.15. This is the first prophetic um, example of looking forward to Jesus Christ, his ministry, and the gospel. Scholars call this the proto-gospel. But right away we see that we lost peace, but we don't need to worry because even though Adam and Eve hadn't been evicted from the Garden of Eden yet, God already had a plan to bring that shalom right back to earth. Now the passage we just read in Zechariah is another prophecy and it reveals God's plan to restore our peace 500 years before this moment where Jesus walks into Jerusalem. And Zechariah actually lays out how this is all going to go down. You know, there's about 450 prophecies in the Old Testament referring to Jesus' birth, right, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. Over 450. So a prophecy is a prediction. So imagine that I said a whole bunch of things right now that I said would take place thousands of years and hundreds of years later. 
And then one by one, they all came true exactly the way I said. That is what we are celebrating every time we remember the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. These things have been prophesied, and they all came true. We know for a fact that over 300 of these can be verified, that we know they happened. I mean, just stop for a minute. Right? Over thousands of years, these prophecies were made. And every single one that we can verify has come true. That is a fact. I'm not talking being religious or, you know, or the Bibles. I'm talking about a fact we know for sure through evidence in the Bible and outside the Bible. We know these things have come true. Shouldn't that give you a little bit of heaven's peace right here on earth? Don't skim over the prophetic. I know some of it's hard. And I know that there's some metaphors and there's some visions and some dreams that we just can't say, thus saith the Lord. We don't know. Can I just tell you it's okay not to know? I feel like I need to say this this morning. Listen to me. We don't have to be right. Okay? What happens is we feel like we need to know it all so we know that we're right. And I'm telling you that's not possible this side of heaven. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right, there's some black and white in the Bible, and then there's some gray. And I know some of the prophetic can be a little bit gray. Right? I know that, but get comfortable in that. It's okay. If you could fully understand God's plan, how big would God be? Not big enough, that's for sure. See, that kind of peace, knowing these prophecies have been fulfilled, makes the peace that God offers very different than what the world offers. Because I know when God says that it comes true, I can smile even though I'm sitting in a storm. Because I know what God says comes true, I can delight even as I travel through a desert that seems to have no end. When I go through earthly pain, but I know it's got a heavenly purpose. God says he's going to redeem it, Romans 8, 28 and 29. I'm good. If I can't have peace in my circumstances, I certainly can have peace in Christ. This is the peace that Jesus invites us to find in him. Not just not fighting, at least not actively. It's real peace. It's real harmony, internally and externally. It's supernatural. So it supersedes your circumstances. It's uncommon. So it doesn't go by common sense. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us that the peace that Christ offers stands guard over our hearts and minds. Think about that for a minute. It stands guard over your heart and your mind, which means it stands ready to fight for you when the enemy tries to lie to you. When Satan tries to do to you what he did to Eve, God is ready. I don't believe that. That's a lie from the pit. Don't Listen, pride and shame, right? Pride and insecurity are two sides of the same coin. Both focus on who you are and not who Christ is. And Satan loves to use your pride and your insecurity. You are not more holy because you are insecure and you beat yourself. Right? You are just as guilty as a person who walks in here religious thinking they're better than everyone else because they're smarter than everyone else. Equally sinful. Because none of that's Christ-centered. And none of that brings peace. I'll tell you this. The most religious, holy rollers I've ever met are the ones that always split churches. When I see some of those people walk in the church, I'm already planning their exit. Sorry. Sorry. If you want to be that religious person, you want to teach us all your wisdom and how great you are and how smart you are, i got ten other churches that would love to have you. But I also don't want you to sit in these seats and beat yourself at how horrible you are. Man, you are valuable enough that Christ died for you on your worst day. He said you are worth it. Like, get your focus off of you. It's for you, but it's not about you. It's about him. See, the reason why we lose so many of these battles to have peace, can I tell you why? Because you say, well, Pastor Mike, I don't have that perfect peace. I don't feel a lot of shalom. Let me tell you why we don't feel it. 
We fight our battles in the flesh, not by faith. So here's what happens. The Bible says the peace of God himself wants to stand guard over your heart and over your mind. And we read that, we go, amen. And then something happens, and instead of resting in that, instead of dropping to our knees and praying, we stand up and start throwing punches. Like, why are we fighting our own battles when we serve a God who's never lost one and says, I want to fight for you? We go, no, I got this, Lord. I got this. You know, as I read Zechariah and as Luke records some of the stuff as Jesus enters Jerusalem, do you ever wonder why? Like, you've ever sat and go, hey, listen, I know Jesus had a good solid three years of ministry, but this celebration as he enters Jerusalem feels like it was planned. Like, how could this spontaneously happen? Like, what, what is going on here that he walks in on a donkey and there's literally the Macy's Day Parade? What is going on that this is happening? They have been waiting hundreds of years for this day. Understand, the Jews in Jerusalem were waiting for the Messiah to come into Jerusalem on this day. This was 173,880 days after the vision God gave Daniel in chapter 9 about the coming Messiah. And Jesus shows up exactly when Daniel said the Messiah would come, riding the same exact animal that Zechariah prophesied he would ride in on. You want to tell me he's not God? <laughs> Are you really trying to convince me that I'm the irrational one for believing in Jesus? I can't predict where I'm going to be next week. But yet, the scripture shows us. That's why in Luke 19, when Jesus comes in, they're chanting and shouting because they're expecting the coming king. They're literally quoting Psalm 118. They're quoting scripture. Why? Because they believe at this point the Messiah is here. They're blessing his name. Right, they're giving him glory. They're shouting, Hosanna. You know what that means? Save us. They're not, like, oh, the healer is here. Oh, the one that feeds with the, you know, the, the loaves and fishes is here. They're saying, Hosanna. They're saying, you're the Messiah. You are here. Please save us. They're laying down palms. Why are they doing that? Well, that is the national Jewish symbol for deliverance since the Maccabean revolts. Right, there's this 500 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? And there's some things that happened in Israel's history. And during that time, during the Maccabean revolts, right, when they were delivered, they would have palms, and they would lay palms down. And then it says what? They're laying down their cloaks. Why are they laying down their, their jackets? That seems kind of s silly, right? No. In their culture, the cloak you had was a symbol of your authority. Remember Joseph? He had a special cloak. So what they're saying is you are the one who's going to save us. You are the deliverer, and we are laying down our authority at your feet. That is what's happening. It's not a spontaneous celebration. This was waited for and planned for. This is a national party. And then the religious leaders show up. And like, what's going on here? We were the big dogs up to five seconds ago. So let's go to Luke chapter 19, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. But some Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He said, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would cry out. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he wept. He said, How I wish today you of all people would understand the way to peace. But it's too late. And it's hidden from your eyes. So humanity had lost God's perfect peace. But God had a plan to bring his peace to all people through the person of Jesus Christ. See, the Jews got the first half right. 
And this is what makes it so sad, is they were prepped and ready for this. They got all the prophecy right, and then they missed the entire point of why Jesus came. They should have known by what Zachariah said Jesus was going to ride in the town on. See, culturally, it doesn't make sense to us, but it would have made perfect sense to the Jews. When a king came in during ancient times to conquer something, he rode in on one of two things, a horse or a donkey. If he came in on a horse, watch out. He came to do battle, right? Jesus is coming back on a horse. He's not coming back to come on the cross again. He's coming back to install his kingdom here on earth again. And just as sure as it happened here, the first time, it's going to happen again. I know this because prophecy after prophecy after prophecy has been fulfilled before our very eyes. How hard-hearted do we have to be not to see it? But if a king came into town on a donkey, it was an offer of peace. So they missed the whole point of what Jesus came in to do because they had a preconceived notion of what they wanted. Jesus wanted something for them. They wanted something else. And as long as he aligned with what they wanted, they would worship him. But if Jesus didn't give them what they wanted, they rejected him. And that's what's about to happen. I mean, this is the only time in Jesus' ministry that we see this kind of planned public de demonstration. And that's because this public fulfillment of these prophecies were designed to declare to the world not just to Jerusalem, the world that the king had come. Right, this is during Passover. So during Passover, Jews from all over the world would come back to Jerusalem to celebrate. So Jesus knows that the second this happens, the message of his messianic rule, his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection would literally go out into the world as the Jews went back home. See, but this was a time when the Jews celebrated something very particular and it kind of, kind of clouded their view to what Jesus had come to do. So Passover was a celebration of how God delivered the Jews out of where? Egypt. Right? How Moses, who was a type of Christ, a representative, right, a foreshadowing of Jesus' ministry, Jesus is the greater Moses, would come and deliver God's people from Pharaoh and from Egypt and bring them to the promised land. So they're waiting for part two. But what they don't realize is they think the big problem they have right now is Caesar and Rome. If we just get rid of Caesar and Rome, we can get to the promised land. But this time around, the problem wasn't Caesar and Rome, it was their sin. They were the problem. See, Rome ruled the world with an iron fist. You think you, you pay high taxes here on Long Island? Triple it. That's what it was like to live under Rome. You think the authorities are unfair out here? Man, times that by 10. You just looked at a Roman soldier the wrong way and you were done for. So they thought, hey, Jesus has come. He's going to deliver us from Rome. Their version of peace was they were about to win a war. It wasn't real peace. It wasn't delight. It wasn't shalom. It was, we're going to come out on top. And when the Jews realized that Jesus didn't come here to do that, as he starts flipping tables in the temple, as he starts calling out the Pharisees for dressing in their nice three-piece suits and driving in their big SUVs <laughs> and pretending they got all their stuff together with their children, when he, starts, when he stops yelling at those people, Right? They go, yeah, it's not the guy we wanted. We wanted someone who was going to rep us better than this. And they shout, crucify him less than a week later. The Romans were not the Jews' biggest problem. All kingdoms here on earth rise and fall. Anyone here meet a Roman citizen lately? The problem was they were at war with God because they had lost their peace with him. Their sin was what Jesus came to conquer. And Jesus knew they weren't going to accept that, which is why he's weeping. They're shouting and praising, and he's weeping. 
but his heart is breaking for them. I need you guys to hear me this morning. Your biggest problem isn't who's in the Oval Office. Your biggest problem is not the taxes you pay here. Your biggest problem is not any other man, woman, or child you're in a relationship with who's driving you crazy. Your biggest problem is not your bank account. Your biggest problem is not fill in the blank. Your biggest problem is that you have lost your peace with God because you are a sinner. Because you offend the creator of the universe every day and you've grown hard to that. That is our biggest problem, ourselves. Sin is what God came, what God sent Jesus to deal with so we can have peace with him again. Every problem you have today will be solved at some point tomorrow. And every conflict you manage to end, a new one's going to pop up. Stop trying to restore that shalom, restore that peace in all the ways that fail you. You're not going to find that peace in another person. You can't. And listen, I love my wife, but I'm not going to find shalom with my wife. She can't offer me that. When I put that on her, I'm actually doing her a disservice. So when I don't feel that delight and that fullness and that wholeness, I blame her. She was never made to do that. Your job was never meant to give you shalom. I know you like to feel valued. I know that you like to walk in and feel like you're accomplishing something. I know that it feels good to do good, but that was never designed to give you shalom. Your bank account was never designed to give you peace. You may think, well, I have X in the bank. My pension's worth X. I got peace. Yeah, okay. Hang, hang out for a minute. None of these things were designed to give us the peace that passes all understanding that only can be found in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. That kind of peace is everlasting. It frees us from bondage. Right? It steadies us in the storm. It finds a purpose in our pain. It gives our life meaning. I love what Paul says in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you find peace in the Prince of Peace this morning? Or will you continually look, it, look for it in places that can't provide it? One day, one day, hear me clearly, one day all of creation will have its shalom restored. No more death, no more hurricanes. The sun will shine brighter. The birds will sing louder. No more aches, no more pains, no more sickness, no more death, no more fighting with each other, no more shame no more guilt, and we will have a shalom that we could never imagine. But hear me clearly. You're going to have a piece of that right here, right now, if you would just bow the knee to the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. As everyone just bows their heads and closes their eyes, I just want to invite you to engage with God's word. This is not a religious ceremony. This is a worship service. The object of our worship is God the Father. And God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins so that we can be indwelled by God the Holy Spirit. And if you want to have a, a feeling of peace you've never experienced before, you need Jesus. So if you're here and you know Jesus, but you're not leaning into that, man, you're finding your peace in every other place. You're trying you're working hard at the gym to get comfortable with your body. You're working hard at work so you feel better about your professional life. You're like, working hard at your relationships so the person you love can find that or provide that for you. And you've realized, hey, listen, that's not really the shalom I heard about this morning. That's not a perfect delight. See, shalom includes this sense of rest and restoration. And you're working really hard for something that has been freely given to you. So if you know Jesus and you say, Pastor Mike, 
I need to get back to finding my perfect peace in the person of Jesus Christ this morning. I repent of trying to find it in other places. Just slip your hand up and slip it down, and I will pray for you. Amen. There are hands everywhere, just so you know, you're not alone. And then maybe you're here, and we're coming up on the Easter season, right? And people are starting to get excited, right? It's part of our cultural heritage here in America. And you came here because you're kind of cool with Jesus. You know about him, but you're not in a relationship with him. I'm here to tell you this morning, there is a difference between knowing him and being in relationship with him. We all sin. I sin. You sin. No one's going to fight me on that. We say bad things. We have bad thoughts. We make mistakes. It's part of our fallen nature. That's because Adam and Eve made a choice. And sin came into the world. But God had a plan for you. For you. He sent his son to die for you. Because you are worth it. He desires peace for you. He wants relationship with you. He wants to save you from yourself. And it's really simple. You don't have to work at this. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is accept by faith. You have to believe. So if you want to experience the peace that Christ offers with God the Father that will literally change your life for eternity, I invite you this morning just to pray with me. These are not supernatural words, but it's giving voice to a change that is happening in your heart. And you say, Father, I have sinned. I have fallen short. But today, I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ. That when he died on the cross, after living the perfect life and shed his blood, that covered my sins. And today, I want to be your son or daughter. And I'm not going to do anything other than believe that Jesus paid that price for me. And I'm asking you to be my father, for Jesus to be my savior. And I'll figure it all out later. But today, you are mine and I am yours. Now, if you prayed that with me, nobody's looking. But I want to celebrate with you. I want to pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and slip it down? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see multiple hands. Now, this is where it gets hard. I say this every week. But like Satan wants to steal that seed that just got planted in your heart. Don't let him. Fill out a little card in front of you. Right? Or you text the word gospel you hear about in a few minutes. Put it in the offering box. Just write your name, contact information. Just write Jesus on it. And I just want to reach out to you this week and just introduce myself, celebrate with you, and help you start your journey of discipleship because you're about to experience a peace that passes all understanding. Father, thank you the gospel still works. Thank you that you can even use a broken stick like me, Father Lord, to hit a straight shot every once in a while. And now I pray as we stand, our hearts will be free to worship you, that everything that's holding us back, holding us down, we just fall away. That we'd experience freedom in this place. But you've told us where your spirit is, there is freedom. Father, we ask that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us and worship the King. I love how even last week we didn't plan songs um, with my dad and best friend. But the song we're singing right now is called Defender, and I know a lot of you don't know it. But pay attention to the lyrics. It says, You go before I know.
it, you know, it's amazing that a sovereign God weaves all these things together. They had no idea what was in my sermon, but they basically sang my last point. Praise the Lord for that. I really do believe that people need to hear this message of peace with a sovereign, holy God. A peace found in heaven that can change how you feel here on earth. So if you know someone who needs peace, please share that message. Just press share on Facebook. It's, it's not hard. And I know you feel like, is that really doing anything? I guarantee you it is. You have a thousand people that call you friend on Facebook. You may have ten in real life. But you have a thousand on Facebook virtually. Share this message with them every week. What a great way to evangelize. Also, we want to connect with you. We want to know who you are. We want you to know us. So we have a number, 631-201-5520. That's the number you can text gospel to if you just got saved. If you want to give, you can text the word give. It'll bring you to giving. If you want some updates, some announcements, text the word church, and you'll just be included on our announcement list. Everything else is on our app. It's free. Just go to Church Center. Put on our zip code, 11776, pick Cornerstone, and you will be at the heart of everything we do. You can sign up. You can give. There's a directory. There's prayer requests. I really encourage you. If you call this place home, you need to have this. We have a few highlight announcements this week. Um, number one, please, please, please invite your friends, family, neighbors, and co-workers to church these next few weeks, study after study show, this is when they're most likely to say yes to a church invitation. They're lost, but they can find Jesus. He knows exactly where they are. They're not lost to him. Also, next Saturday, April 1st, we have our Easter outreach. Our missions team does a great job of providing uh, really an incredible day for the community, but they need help. So find someone in the missions team, go to the back information desk afterwards, um, and find ways that you can contribute, serve, give, and listen, if you have kids, please come. Right? You'll be able to reach young families in a community in a way that I can. Right? So please come to that, be a part of that. Uh, tomorrow night, there is a ladies' event um, led by Sarah Kranz, and it has to do with this uh, couponing thing where she goes shopping and they give her money. I don't know how she pulls that off. It should be illegal, but it's not. So Monday night, tomorrow night, come be a part of that right here at the 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock here at Cornerstone. Uh, I have an announcement about the prayer team, and then I will have a special announcement today. But I do want to say this every single Sunday after church, we have prayer team members on either side. And after service, they're ready to pray for you. They're ready to pray with you. If you have a rejoice, if you want to rejoice in, they want to rejoice. If you want to weep, they want to weep. So I invite you, if you have prayer needs, please come. But I also have a request. If you are not up at the front for prayer, please make your way halfway back in the sanctuary at least. Because it's important that our prayer team members can focus, hear what people are saying, and there's some privacy. Sometimes people have some heavy burdens. So after the service is dismissed, if everyone just push back a little bit, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, also, the Multiplication Center. So we've been talking about this now for about two years. And God has done some incredible things. I invite you to wander down to the end of the building, all the way to that end, to see all the work has been done. Now I know that I've been talking about this for more than two years. But some of you will hear about it for the first time. I don't always fully explain it because in my mind it's clear so I don't communicate well. So let me explain to you so we know what we're doing here. Right? So the multiplication center helps us fulfill our mission and our vision. How does it do that? Well, as a church, it's going to help us build lives for Christ. So we are going to multiply disciples. We are renovating an entire wing of our building. We have space for like ladies' events, men's events, conferences. We have a new Sunday school room, group room. We have a fellowship hall slash cafe. 
that our church will be able to use. It's absolutely incredible what's happening here so we can multiply disciples in this place. But it also helps us with our vision. And our vision is to build God's kingdom on Long Island. We're going to do that by planting, replanting, revitalizing churches. So we're going to find, we're going to invite church planters and replanters and revitalizers in. We're going to plant churches in that end of the building. We're going to see new life in Christ in our community. We'll have a Spanish church, Lord willing, by the fall. That is our prayer meeting on a Sunday morning so they can receive the gospel. We're very exciting stuff. So we do have some meetings. Amen. Thank you. So it's for our church. And it's for other churches. So we can have Christian community here. But we need your help. We need some of you just to give above and beyond, right? Get a little uncomfortable with it. Now you go, oh no, here it comes. If you've been here for any amount of time, you know that I tell people not to give when their hearts are wrong more than I ask people to give. But giving is a command. So I'm going to challenge our church. We have people from all over the country sending in money that has helped us get this far. But this is our house, right? God is expecting us to take care of this. I'm asking you to give above and beyond, right? Don't just take your tithe and give it towards that, but give above and beyond. And then watch what God's going to do. Watch the spiritual fruit that he will bear out of your giving. Someone just donated the pulpit. Like, you know how exciting that is? that whenever someone stands behind that pulpit, they can bear some fruit, right? So please, you know I don't do this often, so I hope you're here in my heart. If you can give, I need you to give right now so we can take this moment where God is doing something so special in our church and turn it into a movement. Amen. All right now, never had that happen before. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Finally, I want to end our service by doing something that we don't do often enough, that I don't do often enough. I'm going to invite my wife to come up. I know, it's weird. Okay, so March is Pastor's Wife Appreciation Month. And I'm going to tell you something you need to know. I couldn't do what I do here without her. And nor would you want me to. You think, some of you are laughing because like, yeah, thank God. She serves selflessly every week. She is an unpaid staff member here. And I'm not exaggerating. She doesn't complain about it. She just shows up. Her phone is always on. I can tell you that because she talks to some of you 1030 at night. Stop calling that lady. Um, she loves this church. She loves to lead worship. She loves the women. She loves to help with the children. She loves to do all the things. And I really am grateful for who you are. I'm grateful for what you do. You're an amazing pastor's wife. You're an amazing wife. And we thank you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you that I see some old faces returning from health struggles and away from the family for a minute. Father, I needed that this morning. Thank you. Thank you that you're still saving people in this place. Thank you people are still giving and loving and serving. Father, thank you for the victories we're about to experience. Four million people, so few churches. Father, you've made a way where there is no way. You called us something greater than we can do without you. So, Father, we lay it before you, knowing that you go before us and that you've never lost a battle and you will not start now. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Be blessed.